Welcome to Roswell United Methodist Church Online. My name is Marian Brown, one of the associate pastors, and this is our on-demand version of the sermon that will be preached on this Sunday morning. And please know that our Sunday services will be live streamed beginning at 9 a.m. for the contemporary service and 11.15 for the traditional service. If you would like to have the entire worship experience on demand, that will be available on Monday morning. We appreciate you being a part of our online community and we invite you to be active and participate through your giving. And so we thank you for your support and your generosity. Before we listen to this Sunday sermon, let's have a moment of prayer. Gracious and holy Lord, we ask that you remind us that wherever we are, we are on holy ground. And so may you help us make space. So may we receive a message that you have for us in this moment. Be in our hearts so that it's open. Be in our ears so that they are open and be a part of our lives so that we are open to receive a challenge and an invitation. Work within us now and all around us so that we may know your presence and we may feel it fully. Through a moment now of words and scripture, speak to us, amen. Let's listen to this Sunday sermon. This morning I'll be reading from the Gospel of Luke chapter 8 and I'll be reading verses 26 through 39. And this is what it says. Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. And when he stepped out onto the land, a man from the city met him who was possessed with demons. And he had not put on clothing for a long time and was not living in a house but among the tombs. And seeing Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, what business do, I, do you have with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had already commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man. For it had seized him many times, and he was bound with chains and shackles and kept under guard. And yet he would break the restraints and be driven by the demon into the desert. And Jesus asked him, what is your name? And he said, Legion, because many demons had entered him. And they were begging him not to command them to go away into the abyss. Now, there was a herd of many pigs feeding there on the mountain. And the demons begged him to permit them to enter the pigs. And he gave them permission. And the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs. And the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and was drowned. Now, when the herdsmen saw what had happened, they ran away and reported everything in the city and the country and the people came out to see what had happened and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone out sitting down at the feet of Jesus clothed and in his right mind and they became frightened those who had seen everything reported to them how the man who had been demon possessed had been made well and all the people of the territory of the Gerasenes in the surrounding region asked him to leave because they were overwhelmed by great fear. And he got into a boat and returned. But the man from whom the demons had gone out was begging him that he might accompany him. But Jesus sent him away saying, return to your home and describe what great things God has done for you. So he went away, proclaiming throughout the city what great things Jesus had done for him. Pray with me. What a great day to proclaim what, what great things you have done for us. May this day be a start, a start and a continuation of, of telling the great things that, that you've done for us. Use the opening of scripture. Use the time of worship as a time to, to listen and to tell. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. John Killinger tells a story 
about a CEO of a shipping company who was on a business trip. He was up in Canada, and this man was known for his good, strong, and, and accurate decisions. But this particular day, he wasn't making good, strong, and accurate decisions. This particular day, he wasn't capable of making even decision whether to get out of bed or not. He was crushed and paralyzed by anxiety. He had so much fear and despair going on in him that he couldn't get out of bed. And as he sat there in despair, he, he said out loud, I wish I were dead. And as his voice broke the silence, he wondered if God heard him say, I wish I were dead. And then he called out to God. And he said, God, it's all a big joke, isn't it? Life's just a big joke. And when he heard his voice call out to God, it hit him. That that was the first time since he was a boy that he had actually spoken to God. And then he goes on to describe it this way. He says, I just talked out loud about what a mess my life was and how tired I was and how much I, I wanted things to be different in my life. And you know what happened next? A voice. I heard a voice say, it doesn't have to be that way. That's all. I sat straight up and turned around. I laughed at myself. I thought I must be hearing things, but then I was absolutely certain that I had heard those words. It doesn't have to be that way. Well, he, when he went home from his business trip, he began to talk to his wife. And he asked her, do you think that was the voice of God? Because I know I heard those words. It doesn't have to be that way. She said, well, I don't know. Why don't you talk to your brother? Well, his brother was a pastor. And when he asked his brother, do you think that was the voice of God? This is what his brother said. Of course, because that's the message of God to you and to every one of us. That's the message of the Bible. That's why Jesus Christ came into the world to save us, to deliver us, to change us, and to show us that it doesn't have to be that way. You don't have to be anxious or depressed or selfish or hopeless. Jesus Christ can turn your life around if you will welcome him into your heart. He will make you a new person. Now the man continued to struggle and to battle, but he knew from that day forward that there was new life for him. He continued to pray. He continued to lean on Jesus Christ. And his life began to change starting that day. That is the message of the Bible. This morning, we read a story where a man was possessed by not just one demon, but legion. Now, a Roman legion was 6,000. He was possessed by 6,000 demons. And we know the way the story goes, and we read it this morning, that Jesus cast those demons into the, the pigs, and they ran over and, and jumped into the, to the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Genesaret. They're both the same body of water. Well, we, we read a story like that, we hear a story like that, and it's miraculous and dramatic. And, and Luke tells stories about Jesus just exactly like that, especially here in, in, in chapters 7 and 8. There, there are three of those stories right in a row. There's a story where Jesus and his disciples are, are, are going into the city of Nain, and as they're going into the, the, the town of Nain, the, there's coming out a a funeral procession. It's a widow whose only son has died. He's a young man, but he, he died, leaving her alone. And, and it says that Jesus saw her and felt compassion for her. He went over, he put his hand on the coffin and said, I say to you, arise. And the dead man sat up. And he gave the young man over to his mother. Now, it doesn't get any more miraculous. It doesn't get any more dramatic than that. 
The next story is a story where it's nighttime and, and Jesus and his disciples are on the Sea of Galilee. It says a gale blew in. It doesn't say, and there was a crosswind or the weather started getting rough and the tiny ship was tossed. It doesn't say all that. What it says, a gale came in. Jesus was asleep in the boat, but the disciples were so afraid, they said, we are dying. And Jesus woke up and with a word, he calmed the wind and the waves. It doesn't get any more dramatic. It doesn't get any more miraculous than that. And so often we begin to press questions onto these miraculous, these dramatic stories and say, well, was the man really dead? Or was he just, his, his heart beat so low nobody could detect it and, and he couldn't fog a mirror. Is that really, or did, the, did Jesus really raise the man from the dead? Or we press the question, well, did Jesus know that these, these strong winds came in on the Sea of Galilee and they would go away and so really what he was telling his disciples, just be patient and it'll go away. And, and hear this story of, of the, the, the man with the demons. Did he really have demons or was it schizophrenia? And it just, that's the only way they had to describe. And we press all these questions on the Bible that the Bible was never intended to answer. That the point of all these stories is that Jesus Christ came to give a new kingdom, a new life. That on the cross, he took that old fallen world of death, of demons, of destruction, of suffering. That death and, and suffering, heartache, evil, it's real. And he took that old creation and he nailed it to the cross to take away its power. And when he rose, he rose to usher in a new kingdom, to usher in new life. It doesn't have to be that way. That Jesus came to bring new life. That's the point of the story. And the point for you and me is he came to offer new life. So take it, take it. That's the first thing that I wanna talk about this morning. Jesus gives new life, so take it. I've been a pastor for a little while now, about 110 years, I guess it is. And <laughs> in those 110 years, I, one of the things I've enjoyed most is, is taking part in celebrations with other folks, key life events, weddings. I, I have no idea how many, probably hundreds of weddings that I've, I've been a part of, and I'm thankful to have done that. And over those 110 years, a lot of things have changed in weddings. I mean, music, it's definitely changed in weddings. Venues, that's definitely changed in weddings. Receptions, wow. Those have definitely changed in weddings. And of all the things that have changed in weddings, there's been one thing that stayed constant. And that's nervousness. Bride and grooms get nervous at their weddings. And sometimes people handle that nervousness with giggling and laughter. And sometimes the bride and the groom are so nervous that all they do is giggle through the wedding. And my job is kind of as an interpreter to say, well, he said, I will, um, to interpret the giggles. Sometimes people get so nervous that they don't giggle they throw up and we try and get that done early on in the service or before the service starts sometimes it's not that they throw up sometimes they freeze up and that's that's probably the most common that people they they go blind deaf and dumb they just don't hear they don't see that they, they're so nervous that and I tell the bride and the groom that you can be brain dead the day of the wedding and I'll lead you through it step by step I remember one wedding I did many years ago. The groom was a brilliant man. I don't mean he was just smart. I mean, he was brilliant. And I got to the church about an hour before the wedding, and that's when the wedding coordinator came to me and said, uh, the groom forgot the wedding rings. He sent the best man back to get the, the rings for the bride and the, the groom. And... Uh, I said, does anybody else know? He said, she said, no, just you and me, the, the groom and the best man. I said, well, when will the, the, 
the bus man be back? She said, well, about 10 minutes after the hour, five, 10 minutes after the hour. I said, well, go to the, the bride and tell the bride that it's raining a little bit outside and the pastor is gonna hold up the, the wedding about five or 10 minutes so all the wedding guests can get in and get seated and see how pretty she looks when she comes down the aisle. And the wedding coordinator said, okay. So I went to go see the groom. Well, he was in the groom's room and he had already dressed, he was prepared. And, and when I opened the door, I can only describe it as he was projectile sweating. <laughs> I mean, it looked like he had squirt guns coming out of his forehead. And around him, there was, a, there was a puddle. He looked like he'd been shot with a fire hose. And he had this, this nervous, nervous look on his face. And I, I looked at him and he said, have you heard? And I said, yes. He said, I told, I told him, I said, I, I told the, the, the wedding coordinator to go to, to your bride and, and tell her that I was going to hold up the, the wedding about five or ten minutes so the, all the, the guests could come in and, and that they could see her coming down the aisle and see how pretty she looked. He looked at me and he said, I love you. <laughs> I said, I know. <laughs> he said, no, I really love you. Can I have a hug? <laughs> and so I said, certainly. Well, we got to the end of it. And, um, and, <laughs> and the wedding went off without hitch. I read where one pastor said, he, he tells the the bride, every wedding, said, I, I know you're nervous and coming down the aisle, if you're nervous, don't look to the faces of the, 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 the guests around you. Just look straight down the aisle. Just look straight down the aisle. And when you get about halfway down the aisle, look to the altar. And then when you get close, look to the groom. Look to him. And sure enough, as she walked in the wedding, that afternoon, the whole congregation could hear her say, I'll alter him, I'll alter him, <laughs> I'll alter him. <laughs> well, I've got some bad news. That if you've ever tried to change another person, it can't be done. That no matter how strong your will, no matter how much you want, we can't change other people. As a matter of fact, the bad news is we can't even change ourselves. Jesus Christ came to give good news. And that good news is that he can do what we can't. That he gives new life. That yes, on the cross, he crucified that old creation. And he rose from the, the grave to give new life to you and to me. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith and not of yourselves. It's a gift of God and not a result of works that no one should boast. That it's grace, that it's grace, that grace is a gift that we've been given. So often we think that grace means no effort. Grace doesn't mean no effort, it means no earning. That we didn't earn the gift, that it's a free gift, but and for, uh, for us to receive that gift, it means we, that we need to take it, to take that gift. 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, train yourselves in godliness. Every athlete who's ever been a part of any sport at all, any musician who's ever sung or, or, or played an instrument, anybody who's ever done anything that's difficult knows that no matter how gifted you are as an athlete, no matter how gifted you are as a musician, or no matter how gifted it are, you are at doing that thing that's difficult, it requires training, that it requires practice. And the Christian life is no different. That Jesus has, has given us a gift, it means that we have an ability, a power beyond ourselves, but it requires training, it requires practice. A training, a practice to be alone in, in prayer, fasting, memorizing scripture, praise. And it's a gift. 
A gift given to you and me that, that changes, transforms a, a life. It's a gift. Jesus offers new life. Take it. Take it. That's my invitation this morning. But not only that, trust him. Trust him. One of the things I, I'm surprised at is that you know, Johnny Cash is still popular among people today. I say I'm surprised because I thought he was old when I was a kid. Well, Johnny Cash tells, told a story about when there was a turning point in his life. He was traveling through Georgia and he said at the time that he was addicted to pills. That he was taking pills that would, would bring him up before his performances and concerts. And then after the concerts, he would take more pills that would bring him down so he could sleep at night. And that he was taking about 100 pills a day. Some to bring him up, some to bring him down, and some just to, to, to bring him out of it. Well, he said one morning he was traveling through Georgia. He woke up in jail. And standing at the, the door in the jail was the jailer. And the jailer said to him, Johnny, one of the night men found you stumbling around the streets. We only brought you in so you wouldn't hurt yourself. You're doing time right now, Johnny, the worst kind of time. I'm a big fan of yours and I've always admired you. It's a shame to see you ruining yourself like this. I didn't know you were this bad off. I don't know where you think you got your talent from, Johnny, but if you think it came from God, like I do, then you sure are wrecking the body he put it in. The jailer opened the door and let Johnny Cash go free. Johnny Cash, reflecting on this later, said, it was that reference to God that suddenly cleared my mind because until that morning, it hadn't occurred to me to turn to God for helping me in kicking my habit. Suddenly I realized that I would need all the power I could get and I knew this power could come only from God. I asked him to go to work on me, then and there. He saved me, he turned me around, he set me free. This morning, I don't know what troubles you have. I don't know your failures. I don't know your heartache. But I do know Jesus Christ. And I know the power that he gives. It's a power for new life that you can trust him. Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. Faith, faith isn't just something we do with our head, it's what we do with our heart, soul, mind, and strength. It means that we trust him, that we lean on him. Heart, soul, mind, and strength. Not once and everything is changed daily, hourly, minute by minute. Did we trust him? He has strength and power that you don't have. And he loves you dearly. You can trust him. Jesus gives new life. Take it. Trust him. And the last thing that I want to talk about this morning is tell it. Tell it. I read a story about a man who was arrested. He stood before the judge and the judge asked him and said, do you have an attorney? The man said, no judge, I don't. The judge said, then the court will appoint an attorney to represent you. He's a good attorney. And the man said, thank you, judge, I need a good attorney. But more than that, I need a good witness. And that's what Jesus asks for here. That Jesus has, has cast the demons out of the man. And it says that here in verse 35, it says that the man was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed then in his right mind. And then in verse 39, Jesus said to the man, return to your home and describe what great things God has done for you. We're not asked to give the history of the Christian church. 
or outline the doctrines of the faith. But you and I are called to, to witness, to describe what great things God has done for, for you and for me. To go home, home, and to tell it. And this morning, my invitation to you is that tonight, tonight, I want to invite you to ask your husband or your wife to reflect back on the day and say, what do you want to thank Jesus for? Or it may be your children that you gather, your, your husband, your wife, your children, and you, you ask, what do you want to thank Jesus for? And you tell it, and you write it down today. Or it may be that you want to call a friend, and you, you, you call that, that friend, and you say, you know, here at the end of this day, I'm very thankful. And I just want to tell you what, what I'm thankful for. And, and you tell it, and you tell it. And then Monday night, I want to invite you to do the same thing. Take time to, to look back over the day. And what do you want to thank Jesus for? And you tell it. And you write it down. Well, you'll find if you do that every day during the week, your gratitude will grow. What you'll find is that you, you'll begin to train your eyes to see. To take inventory. And God will build in you a heart of gratitude as you tell it. And you won't be able to be quiet about it. And you'll begin to tell more and more. This morning it may be that the thought of telling someone is a thought that's beyond anything you can imagine. That you know that'll be very difficult. And it will make you very uncomfortable. Well, what if Jesus died on the cross and rose from the grave, not to make us comfortable, but to make us his? His own possession, his own people that describe the great things that he's done for us. That rather than dying on the cross and rising from the grave to make us comfortable that he he died on the cross and rose from the grave that we might give thanks that we might tell others about him sometimes I hear people say well my, my witness is is my actions that's a good thing please do not stop but Jesus didn't carry the weight of the gospel just by looking like the Son of God. He did it by word and deed. And this world won't be changed by people just looking healthy. We have to tell folks who the great physician is. And his name is Jesus. And Jesus came to give new life. Take it. Trust him. And tell it. Pray with me. Jesus, this day, I ask that you begin to, to train us into a practice where we practice praise, thanks. We practice your presence. That we practice prayer, fasting, And memorizing scripture. That there's a, a training that we need to do to take the new life that you offer us. You've given us strength enough to do it. Help us to take that strength, that power that you give in your spirit. That we trust you. And that we have strength enough to tell others. May it start in our homes and and grow from there. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much for joining us online. It is a blessing to have the gift of technology to have sermon this way. We thank you for participating. And just a reminder, if you wanna see the live services, 9 a.m. on Sunday for contemporary and 11.15 Sunday morning for traditional services. And always we will have the full on-demand worship experience on Monday morning. And if there's ever a time that you would like to join us here at the physical location, we're located at 814 Mimosa Boulevard, Roswell, Georgia. We want to be connected with you. If you have a prayer request, please let us know by emailing pray at rumc.com. And we would love for you to be a part of our ministry through your giving. If you would like to support our campus and our ministries, you can do so at rumc.com slash give. And now hear these words of a benediction. Love without fear, serve with commitment. And in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.